Yes, good evening everyone and welcome to this fourth live cast of the international project Climate Citizen Assemblies Learning With, From and For Europe. It's a collective learning project uh, around Climate Citizen Assemblies uh, which explores how citizens can help us come to effective, sustainable and just climate policies while at the same time strengthening our democracies. So in the last couple of weeks, we've already gathered uh, a lot of valuable information uh, on this type of deliberative democracy. Um, and we've uh, collected everything and, and, and uh, brought it together on our online knowledge platform. Um, and if you have a look uh, on there, you can already find, well, the previous live casts with the conversation with other European key players, uh, but also some in-depth interviews that we've done uh, looking at specific case studies. Uh, but you can also listen to uh, the, the most recent podcast that we made uh, with David van Rijbroek, one of the speakers tonight. Uh, so if you want to uh, hear his story for even longer than, uh, than you will hear tonight, please have a look at that as well. Um, if all goes well, there will be a link below uh, that you can use to, to check it out. Um, so tonight, number four uh, of the series, and uh, tonight we have decided to zoom in on, well, actually one of the most crucial elements uh, of, of this entire project, which is uh, climate change. So in previous sessions, we have looked a lot at citizen assemblies, but we actually haven't given that much attention to this issue of climate and climate change. So uh, we're gonna discuss uh, the polarization that exists around this uh, topic, uh, the political deadlock that we have arrived in and that we desperately need to break through uh, to, to come to, uh, to change that, uh, that can bring us forward. Um, so what we have done is that we have invited various European um, speakers, um, well, important key players again uh, within this field to share their experiences, to share their insights um, uh, and well, to hopefully get a step further in this, uh, in, in this process of understanding why a climate citizen assembly uh, is important and what it can bring us all. Um, so those are the speakers, but I also ask you as our loyal audience to please engage in this conversation. Um, if you log in through the website of Pakhuis de Zwijger and you log in through Zoom, you're uh, entering the space where you can ask uh, questions and make remarks uh, through the chat and the Q&A function. Those questions uh, will arrive here with me and I will incorporate it into the conversation. So please do that. Um, if you're watching and you think that you want to share some uh, perspectives that is, might be a little bit too much to incorporate into the session today, but you do want to share or you want to connect uh, to us or to the project, please send me an email um, and uh, I, well, I really look forward to, uh, to reading it. Um, those were all the, the basic things. Uh, we're just immediately going to get into um, the topics and we're gonna start with three lovely people uh, here in the studio with me, Eva Rovers, cultural historian and co-founder of Bureau Burgerbraat in the Netherlands. Welcome back, Eva. Thank and you. then through Zoom, uh, we have two speakers joining us uh, at this moment, uh, Benito Walker, the chairperson at the Youth for Climate in the Netherlands. Benito, welcome. And you, the earlier David. mentioned David van Rijbroek, uh, also a cultural historian, but, but at the same time an archaeologist, which I find very intriguing. Um, he's also founder of the Movement for Democratic Renewal, the G1000, and author of many books, but the most important one for this session is Against Elections. Welcome, David. Great to have you here. Um, hey. All right, so just to to uh, lay the foundations of this, uh, of this, of this evening. Um, climate change, We're, Eva, we have, like I mentioned, we've, this is the fourth session, so we've already talked with many uh, speakers from Europe. Um, why is it so important that we now focus on this issue of climate? Yeah, well, the, the entire series uh, is of course about climate citizens assemblies and mm -hmm. climate has of course played a, uh, a part in Absolutely. all of our discussions. Absolutely. Um, but of course you're right, we, we really focused on how to organize a proper climate citizens assembly focusing on what it can 
uh, do to strengthen democracies, what it's, uh, how important inclusion and representation is, how important uh, a proper mandate is, uh, political follow-up. We those are all crucial elements, and I'm very, very happy that we all yeah. that we had a chance to discuss all those yeah. topics. All building but, blocks. Yeah. Yes, and yeah. very important building blocks. Um, but of course, the first word <laughs> of this series is perhaps the most important building block: climate citizens assemblies. You can have, you can organize uh, citizens assemblies on well a, ver uh, a lot of different topics yeah. but this is um, a topic climate change is a topic that that, that really screams to have uh, uh, climate citizens assemblies organized for um, and why i think this is so important is that uh, well we talk about climate change but in fact we are really in the middle of a climate crisis of a climate emergency uh, the choices we make at this very instant at this time yeah. in um, in history will absolutely determine the livelihoods not only of our generations but also of the generations to come and we see that uh, dangerous thresholds are v much closer than we thought uh, previously we already see some tipping points in which climate change really accelerates uh, so um, well there is a, a new IPCC IPCC report coming out that's the uh, scientific uh, of the, the, the group of uh, uh, climate scientists working for the uh, for the UN. Uh, the previous report was really alarming, uh, saying that we only have 12 years now, only 10 years, nine years, to yeah. to take proper action. And I think the next report will be even more alarming. So, and the longer we wait, the more time we take to think what we need to do um, about climate change, the longer we take, the more uh, invasive, the more far-reaching the measures will be. And that means that those measures will probably will be taken more and more in a less democratic way. And I think that's not a situation we want to head for. We need yeah. more democracy yeah. instead of less democracy, yeah. uh, especially when it comes to climate change, because yeah. this is really, well... well and, think, and climate policies, of course, because the measures that you refer to, in, in, well, if you translate that into how po politicians would go about it, it, it becomes a climate policy. And that's al already something that, well, steps are being taken, but it also causes for a lot of um, unrest uh, yeah. and resistance. So that's also one of the issues that we're going to dive in deeper eh, on, uh, on this specific uh, theme. Um, we're going we're gonna to move to Benito, because Benito is also very, very much, um, uh, well, I think, sharing the urgency that you just uh, described when it comes to the climate crisis that we are currently in. Uh, Benito, you're the chairperson at uh, Youth for Climate uh, here in the Netherlands. Can you just briefly introduce us to this uh, to this movement and what you hope to achieve with that uh, yes definitely um, well we are uh, an organization that focuses primarily on um, uh, education about uh, youth people uh, younger people who have the who also feel the urgence that um, that the climate crisis has and they're scared of their future because what's the future going to hold for us? Um, and they feel like they don't really get the resources and the knowledge uh, in order to to fight the climate crisis. They feel like we, we're not getting prepared to fight the crisis that, um, well, that threatens our entire existence, our entire future. And what we're trying to do with this organization is, uh, on the one hand, we're trying to well, get those concerns to the people who can actually make policy. And we try to, um, well, get that input back to younger people in order to tell them, oh, this is something you could, uh, you could do to contribute um, to solve, you know, to solve the, the climate crisis or at least to help solve the climate crisis. Yeah, so it's a, so, double, uh, a double exchange. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Because yeah. Young, it seems like young people are are striking and and are uh, well expressing their uh, their their feelings uh, about what's not uh, been done, uh, the lack of the lack of action, mm. and that all comes forward out of um, fear. Because why why don't I get the knowledge? 
in order to fight this battle, in order to get myself prepared to fight the climate crisis and to yeah. help to solve it. Yeah. And um, when I when I researched uh, you and and uh, and your work, I, I also saw that well in Dutch it's the four Ds, but I think it's sustainability, action, um, democracy, and the last one. <gasps> I forgot the last one. Ooh. Sustainability. It's Sustain not a D in English, but uh. yes, <laughs> yeah. Um, but but democracy stood out in in this uh, in this line as well. Um, yeah. uh, wh why? How does this relate to democracy uh, from your perspective? Well, um, well, it's very important. I mean, at this point, I think we can realize that uh, the climate movement is still a movement, and in the Netherlands, it's a left movement. And a left movement. What we're trying. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a part of uh, well left uh, political parties, and what we're trying to um, to show that it's not a left um, subject. It's something that we're all facing. It's everybody's problem, and we need to start um, talking about it like it's a problem for everybody. And that also means that's our opinion that everybody needs to be included in the solution, which means you need, um, well, a, a very wide range of people and a very w wide range of politicians who are going to come together and get to a solution. Hmm. So that's the, the, the democratic part in there. Uh, yeah. We have to do it together. And, and what about uh, climate citizen assemblies? Is that already a form that you are researching or working with? Or is, are you also here tonight to, to, to absorb all new information? Definitely. Um, I'm not very familiar. Uh, of course, I studied a little bit uh, to prepare for the session. Um, and yesterday we were in uh, The Hague to, uh, to uh, well, to tell... Uh, uh, our political parties, our government, that they should be organizing a citizens', a citizens assembly. But I think um, that's crucial if we want to really get forward and uh, break the deadlock that we are in right now. I think it's, it, it might be the only way mm. because uh, I feel like um, it, it's, it's politicized. It's a problem that can't be solved at this moment because... Mm. Well, politicians feel like they don't really, you know, they don't really have the mandate to do it. So I think a citizens' assembly is exactly what we need right now. Mm. And um, so you you actually mentioned two things, right? You ha we have a, a wrong framing. Climate is is framed as a as a lefty lefty thing in the Netherlands. Well, it is not. It's something that concerns us all. And at the other hand, other hand, we we also we need everyone. We cannot solve this problem if we don't include everyone. Um, you are part of a of a grassroots movement. But what do you think the role of grassroots movements of of citizens is when it comes to to making that step? Well, I think it's um, it's primarily to to well, give the, the people who are, who can actually do something uh, um, the feedback and the help to and to show them that there is a lot of unrest uh, within society, and and that's exactly what we're trying to do because um, there's a lot of uh, complaints, there's a lot of uh, frustration, and we try to get all of that together and put it into something that can actually help. Yeah, and we're trying to really come up with solutions, and I think that's also uh, part of, yeah, what grassroots organizations should be doing. Yeah, make a con constructive contribution. It's interesting Definitely. though that you yeah. mentioned the the lacking of mandate for politicians. Well, the lacking of mandate is also something that we are have been discussing a lot when it comes to the citizen assembly. But then more on the on the side of the citizen assembly as well. Yeah. Maybe if I, I maybe you want to react or add, add to yeah, that. Yeah, well, I think that that, that uh, Benito is absolutely right. I think you um, uh, perhaps we as a society uh, need to show politicians that we really. Um, uh, uh, urge we really need those uh, that 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 ambitious climate uh, uh, policy yeah. that it's not something they have to be afraid of they don't have to they don't have to think that they will lose the next elections or anything but it's yeah. something that uh, that a lot of people um, are really uh, asking for um, so yeah I think that's it's an interesting point um, 
what I also find very interesting with the Youth for Climate is that it's also um, well a European organization, yeah. and uh, it really um, it shows that it, that that well that climate change is not something that you can only um, uh, deal with in in one country. It's and not a local also, issue. <laughs> I see, yeah. uh, Benito also wants to uh, react to that. Yeah. But I thought that's just something. Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. No, no uh, please. definitely, because <laughs> uh, Youth for Climate is an organization that's uh, primarily based in uh, Netherlands, Belgium, France and uh, Luxembourg. And what we're trying to do is now come together also with Fridays for Future um, in, in uh, Germany and Italy. And we want to show the European Commission that if they won't take action, if they don't come together, we will do it as rep representatives of our countries because we're trying to uh well we feel really frustrated that um that nobody listens to us um and that's primarily also why we strike so much we feel like nobody listens to our concerns we are scared of our future and nobody listens to 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 those concerns and that's what we're trying to do work together internationally because that's crucial it's not something that stops at, uh, at the border. It's something yeah. the entire world is going to face. Uh, yeah. yeah, so hopefully it will spread out even further than the, the countries just mentioned. Uh, David, if I, if I can go to you. So what strikes me is that we... Um, uh, a, a couple of things are being said, right? So we are talking about that climate is not a left a left wing issue. We're also talking about that um, uh, we need to tell, actually tell, give pol politicians the mandate that they can trust that we really want climate measures, right? That we want action, climate action. Uh, but at the same time, you also see that there's a resistance against climate measures that are being taken and that the issue itself is is uh, very polarized and that politicians are, are stuck in this deadlock position, uh, not, not acting. So how do you explain um, those different forces? Why do you think climate change, well, climate in itself is such a polarized issue? Yeah, you're absolutely right. And it's, it's a matter of great concern to me to see to what extent uh, climate as a topic has become part of the, of the cultural wars. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of polarization around climate because there's a, a lot of polarization around everything. Uh, whether, whether it is European integration, migration, vaccination, 5G, you name it. Uh, you name any topic and there's going to be a polarization around it. So there's nothing unusual about mm. this polarization. On the surface, it looks like a very serious phenomenon, that polarization. But I think it's only a superficial phenomenon because I found it hard to imagine that large parts of societies do not want to survive. I would find it strange to imagine that large parts of society do not care about their children or grandchildren or next generations. And so we need to get beyond superficial anger. We need to get beyond superficial reactions, which are just part of the culture wars. It's a ritual. It's almost a symbolic, a symbolic battle that is being waged every day. But I think we need to find procedures that help us to get beyond. I couldn't agree more with Benito when he says uh, this is not a leftist topic. Historically, it's true, climate has become a, a leftist topic. Uh, but it's so strange. I mean, does that mean that right-wing parties just a few years ago were so much uh, involved with fighting terrorism because it was a danger to our security and a danger to our safety. Are they today no longer concerned about a much bigger danger that we are facing than, 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 uh, than terrorism? I mean, if you were a conservative, how come you care so little about conservation of nature? I mean, it's in the very same word. <laughs> so right-wing parties would uh, do well to readjust their logic and their political thinking uh, along the lines of safety and security. And I think it would be very, very helpful to move beyond the awareness that climate is just something for the Green Party, is just something for the leftists. Mm. Um, and I think climate assemblies 
could be very, very useful in that respect. Yeah. And, and David, um, when looking at, um, so you're saying polarization in itself is actually already part of, of our society in such a way that you, you see it around many, many, many topics. Um, uh, the, I'm, I'm also interested to know, like, what is the role, for example, of the media in this? Because the media has a, a, can have a very polarizing effect, but can also have a, well, I, I, what I'm hearing from you is also about how do you frame an issue? How do you communicate an issue? Um, maybe it is framed as a leftist uh, thing, but uh, which role does the media play uh, in, this, in this specific situation? Well, obviously they play a massive role. Um, they, it's up to them to, to, to beat up the polarization or to make sure that there's still room for reasonable debate Luckily, the countries we are talking about, uh, you're in the Netherlands, I'm talking to you from Brussels. We are both countries with fairly strong national media, uh, even national state media, which have a role to bring nuanced, uh, balanced, uh, balanced news. And, and fortunately, they do a reasonable good job. Unfortunately, since about 15 years, social media have taken over uh, a lot of the communication and 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 news uh, role that traditional media and especially, especially traditional public media used to have before. So for, <laughs> for quite a number of people, Facebook and Twitter have become a more reliable source of information than the NOS news or, mm. or, or national radio for that matter. Yeah. And, and that is worrying because social media, despite their name are not that social. They are quite polarizing media. There is a bonus for Mark Zuckerberg if we disagree. If we disagree, he gets richer. So everything in the, in the, in the algorithm is, is geared towards tearing us apart. Hmm. Facebook is a div divisive instrument. Twitter is a divisive instrument. Yeah. Now we need to, it's, the point is not that people should watch the NOS uh, news more often. The point is we should get out from our computers and go and sit down together and talk to each other and learn to talk with people with whom we might disagree. These days, <laughs> it seems we talk a lot about other people. We very often talk with them. Yeah. And I think climate assemblies and citizens assemblies in general are a great tool for bringing people together yeah. who belong to different internet bubbles. Yeah. Great. I see Benito also wants to um, make a comment. Maybe we can get Benito back on screen. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, I want to add, uh, David said, um, you know, we have uh, a part of the, the crisis and the, the reason we can't solve it is because we have a lot of disinformation going around mm -hmm. on social media. And I think we can uh, tackle that definitely with citizens' assemblies, but also with more education. Yeah. If, if you want to, to prepare our uh, uh, well future leaders of the world, uh, people of my age, uh, well, actually people younger uh, than I am, on how to solve the climate crisis, we need to educate them. Yeah. If we want to change the way we, uh, we talk about the climate crisis, we need to educate them. And I think also a citizen, citizens' assembly is... Uh, well, part of that solution, more education. Yeah, let's let's go deeper into that that possibility, right? So we're we're basically go, going to explore if and if so how citizen assemblies can help us break through this state of being in bubbles uh, and 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 uh, polarizing to that extent that um, the result is actually not action but. Uh, a passive uh, reaction um, and what we're going to do is um, later on uh, Eva will also tell us about uh, the, the lobby that is going on in the Netherlands uh, to come to a, a climate citizen assembly but we're first going to hear from uh, Dimitri Courant and he is a PhD candidate in political science at the University of Lausanne and the University of Paris um, number eight I actually don't know if that's how you introduce your university in English, uh, but Dimitri is specifically focusing on citizen assemblies, on the liberation, on sortition, uh, and he has very carefully um, um, researched the French 
Climate Citizen Assembly, which is a very interesting case specifically when it comes to the issue of polarization, uh, because it's, it all started with uh, civil unrest. So, uh, Dimitri, thank you so much for joining us. And please, can you well, give us a, a glimpse of, of your view on the, the French Climate Citizen Assembly uh, from this perspective? Yeah, thank you so much for, for having me here. Um, I think maybe I'm going to take a little um, different perspective on polarization because I think that in some cases polarization is actually necessary and important. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, there is nothing to deliberate about if there is not a strong disagreement between sides, then then there is nothing much to to discuss and it's not worth it putting millions of euro in a in a citizen assembly if everybody already agrees. Like we're not going to have a citizen assembly on something where there is no debate. Uh, even though yeah. <laughs> nowhere there's everything. So we, but so we shouldn't it. try to depolarize uh, this issue of climate change. I, th I think one of the aim of deliberation is to clarify the dissensus, or uh, so it it helps to understand why some people held a view or a position and why other people don't. Um, then you can actually decrease polarization if you realize that the reason you were opposed to something was actually unsound and resting on no, nothing or no evidence, mm -hmm. or you can actually held a stronger position that, that you were actually right. And actually you have even more information to understand that your position was actually the good one yeah. and you're not going to back down on that. So that I would, I would approach with, with caution. I think, and I think in, in the way you, you frame the debate, it's important to have that in mind because for what I could see of the of the French Convention, but also I also worked on the on the Irish case. Um, sometimes, especially for climate, there is a translation of a scientific consensus on the reality of climate change and the fact that it's caused by, by human beings, which which there is a consensus, and then climate policies or public policies, which are going to affect economy, so, uh, redistribution, uh, how you organize your country, your cities. Uh, work, uh, the economy, globalization. And that, that is not something for which there is a, a clear consensus. Mm. Uh, so I think in that regard, it's important to show that there is not so much a consensus <clears throat> or not at all uh, on, the, on, on the fact that there is climate change and yeah. we need to do something about it, but there is competing options. Yeah. And, okay, so let's and, be more precise. We're talking about the, the lack of consensus on climate policies. That's actually yes. what, what we want to dive into further. Yeah. Yes, and I think Great. beyond just policies, like what is at heart of this type of debate is what type of society do you want to live in? That's that's the question. And I think in, in, in actually both cases, both the Irish and the and the French case, there has not been so much a debate about in terms of structures. They, 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 they divided the assembly in France in type of group for housing, um, uh, consuming, producing and stuff. Mm -hmm. But but that they did not have a debate like about global structure. For instance, is GDP a relevant indicator? Should we take into consideration GDP? Because that's, that's actually a building blocks upon which a lot of things are built within the economy. Um, so, so this debate did not happen. And when we can have a debate whether GDP is good or not, and we can have a scientific debate because there has been scientific work on other type of indicator of wealth, for instance, taking into consideration yeah. uh, the ecological impact or, or happiness of citizens. Uh, but this debate did not happen, uh, for instance. And I, I, I think what happened is was very clear, quickly you were put into choosing policies. And very quickly, because the assembly was divided and then divided even further within small subgroups, it was discussion about very specific policies. And in the end, it's, it is said that what, what the assembly created was a, a coherent whole, but it is more out of, a, uh, of luck than out of design, because it, the assembly did not have enough opportunity to discuss all the proposition, nor to understand how each proposition was articulating with one another. Mm. Uh, because of this, of its division. Yeah. So uh, the exchange, the in... yeah, the exchange between those different subgroups were too little. So the citizens within the citizen assembly were were divided in smaller groups, but there were, was no interaction between those groups. Is that what you're saying? There was there was some, but not a lot. Uh, and I, I mean, in a, in a paper, I compared the French case with the Irish case, and the thing is that the Irish case also had tables because you cannot talk at one hundred at the same time all the time. But the thing is that the table were discussing the same topic, hearing from the same expert, and then sharing back to the plenary and saying, okay, 
Mm. Here at table one, this is what we think. While the French um, and the table were shuffled from one weekend to another. So you were not always with the same person yeah. in your group. Uh, in, the, in the French case, it was, not, it was not how it worked. You were fixed in your group from first weekend to last weekend. And you were fixed to a, them, a, a thematic. And you could not exit this, uh, this, this thematic, which means that sometimes there were plenary moments where you could actually listen to quickly what the other has been working on, but it was, it was too limited. Hmm. Um, and why, and why does that concern you, Dimitri? Why is that important, this, yeah. this comparison between the Irish and the French model? I think because if, you, if what you want is uh, 150 or 100 or 200 brains working together on a problem, if you divide them of group of 30 or 5, then you have five brains working on this problem and then the other 130 or so brains are going to be working on other problems and then the, the coherence might be, might be a bit tricky to get at the end. Um, mm. And also I think the other thing that was a bit um, a bit problematic precisely in terms of polarization and, and with a colleague we conducted an analysis on that is that the, the level of disagreement with not between citizens but between invited speakers which are who could be experts or stakeholders or activists uh, was very rarely voiced as a disagreement like there was someone coming from a, from a union or for, from an NGO uh, holding position against growth for instance if, if you know what they are saying and then again, next to them there was a CEO of a, of a big company but they did not voice the disagreement they did not say my vision of society is actually at some point going to clash with your interest uh, they were presenting their perspective. So the CEO said, innovation is going to save us. And then the, the NGO said, we need to rethink how we uh, share wealth and how we share work uh, in, our, in our society. And it did not, you know, it did not seem to be, to be in contradiction. So I would tend to think that it, is, it would be more fruitful to have a pro and contra, to have someone advocating a position, highlighting what's good about this position and someone else advocating the, the shortcomings, the drawbacks, the unintended consequences of this of this reform, and then you can decide because no no policy is perfect, of course, yeah. and it's going to be a trade off, yeah. and it needs to be taken as a, a trade off. Some people are going to win, some people are going to lose yeah. some stuff. Maybe it's worth it. So rather than giving a pitch, it's about really stating your uh, perspective with the accompanying uh, consequences of that to really enter into. A conversation into a debate uh, on on the pros and cons of both sides. That would actually be a better approach. I, I would think so, and also connected to the values that they hold. Because at some mm. point, I think um, it's not just about fact checking, uh, verifying the information is correct. It's also about about what perspective and values uh, you you hold. Um, like the example I, I always take is, for instance, uh, are a very rich billionaire. Uh, earning their money and therefore deserving to have all that wealth, or and, and you say they merited it, or did you, or are you going to adopt another perspective? But that's that's a value-based perspective, saying uh, we should have actually a redistribution and they should they should give back to society what society is giving to them. Yeah. But that is not something that can be fact checked. It's yeah. something that is connected to how you view society, how you view justice, and politics. In the end, it's about your sensation of what is just. Um, and, and it cannot be uh, breaking down just to, I'm checking the, the information. Of course, checking the information is absolutely paramount because you cannot think if you don't have the correct information, yeah. but it cannot be the entire story. Yeah, Eva? Yes, I, I was wondering, uh, I, I completely agree with uh, um, how important it is during a Climate Citizens Assembly to not just talk about measures or, or um, uh, specific topics, but really have a conversation about values. What do you think is important? What do you think is uh, valuable to, to treasure? Uh, and also to, to see how other people think about this and to see how you can, uh, where you agree or do not agree. Uh, but where in the process would you have that conversation? What would you, because it's, it's about, it's, it's, um, it also immediately relates to uh, to the bigger picture. It's not about measures or policies. It's really about your worldview, about uh, changing an entire system, perhaps. Uh, so where in the process would you have that conversation about values and yeah. the way you would organize a society? I, I think one, one of the interesting stuff that, the, um, that we can learn from the, the, uh, the Citizen Assembly on electoral reform is that what the, it's what it's exactly what they try to do. They try to say, okay, what do we value 
what goods uh, and values should an electoral system bring to us? Uh, rep fair representation, opportunities for the citizen to influence uh, the policies that are made and so on. And they listed the values and then they looked at, okay, they, they discussed what are the values we actually hold important, somewhere cast aside, somewhere prioritized as being really, really crucial. And then they looked, okay, which electoral system is going to allow us to reach uh, those values and those goals? And and I, I I would tend to so every time they were looking at the system at the reform they were going back to their list of values to check whether it was it was actually fitting them or not and I think that's that's a productive way of, of of thinking about it it's you want to go somewhere and then you decide whether you're going to to go this route or, or this or this road but but what's important is where you want to go it's not and I think that's one of, maybe that's one of the problem in having some very expert driven processes is that at some point the citizens are no longer talking as citizens they're talking like experts they're going to talk in uh ton de co2 uh, <laughs> and, and 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 in acronyms and with very complex yeah. terms and for, for me very at the end of the, yeah uh, yeah for me at the end of the french process i followed it entirely uh, every single weekend but at some point i was i was lost uh like they were talking about stuff that was so complex that were connected mm. to detail in a, in a directive that was made 10 years ago uh, or, or the, and it was really hard to to to, to keep yeah. following that and, and i think that's a challenge how yeah. do you make sure that the debate doesn't stay in the room with the randomly selected yeah. citizen but also yeah. reach the entirety of society yeah well that's that's the in the final round we're really going to use all our collective brains to to figure this question out so let's let's save that one for a little bit later uh benito i see that you raise your hand but i'm i'm first gonna ask eva to uh reflect on the dutch case and then we're gonna all join the conversation okay so bear with me um so eva so um of course the french case is quite different from the one in the netherlands uh because in france the process has already well it's in a way further stage than uh, than here uh, but you are one of the main people here in the netherlands lobbying for a climate citizen assembly uh, to happen uh, so can you just give us an introduction like what what the situation is uh, over here well at, at this time um I think we are at a very decisive uh, moment, but just to give a short uh, overview of um, what has happened over the last uh, few months, I think um, the, the French uh, Convention Citoyenne was really um, a boost uh, here in the Netherlands to draw more attention to the possibility yeah. of climate citizens' assemblies. Before that, before um, uh, uh, the French uh, Citizens' Assembly, there were a lot of people already uh, arguing for a climate citizens assembly, especially um, uh, Extinction Rebellion in the Netherlands, who really have been pushing for a climate citizens assembly for a long time, who really paved the way. Um, but then the, uh, the, the French citizens assembly uh, occurred, and uh, especially when the, when the results of the outcome was presented, that really showed, I think, Dutch politicians that this is really something you can uh, you can use and you can which is extremely valuable when you are uh, thinking about how to organize, uh, well, your future in a way, how yeah. to make uh, climate policy and make sure that uh, the whole society is involved, is engaged in, the, those, uh, in, the, in, that, in that policy, in the decision making. Uh, so that, that really helped. Um, in uh, October of last year, um, there was a uh, motion tabled in Parliament asking for a research on uh, citizens' assemblies in general and how they may help the Dutch government in their climate policy and energy uh, uh, policy and energy transition. This research uh, um, uh, has already been done by uh, Alex Brenningmeyer and his team. Um, and this was presented right after the Dutch elections. Uh, we had elections here in March, um, and the idea was uh, that that report on on how uh, climate citizen assemblies may help the Dutch government to yeah. to formulate new plans and to engage the rest of the public. Uh, this report uh, was published um, uh, after the after the election, and the idea was that uh, that the, the political parties could use it to form a new coalition to to uh, take it into account when they were. 
um, uh, uh, writing uh, the, the plans for the next few years. Yeah. So this could really be a topic when the different political parties uh, were, uh, well, would be discussing uh, how to form a new government. Yeah. Well, this was three months ago. <laughs> we still don't have a government. And probably this will take uh, a, a few months yeah. more. Yeah. So this is very difficult. Uh, we Even see though the, the political support is it's, yeah. it's range, it's a quite a broad range. Yeah. Uh, what it's, is very it's not in that sense a left, leftist thing. No, and uh, that's, a that, I think that's, that's a very important yeah. uh, issue. I think that's very hopeful as well, that yeah. there, is, uh, there are uh, parties from, uh, from the right, the center and the left, who are really arguing for a, uh, a climate citizens assembly. Uh, some of those uh, political parties also wrote those plans in their um, uh, programs before the elections. Yeah. So it is a topic that is um, uh, on the momentum. Yeah, it's gaining yeah. momentum. It is on the political agenda. So that is all very well. Um, but time, <laughs> uh, we need to have a climate assembly. I think this year we can't wait and um, also, uh, I think there will be a climate assembly in the Netherlands, but I think it's very, very important that it is a proper assembly with a very ambitious question, with a proper mandate, yeah. uh, with a clear view on how, this, how the outcome of this climate assembly will receive political follow-up. Yeah. So that's something that um, organizations like Extinction Rebellion, Trans Transitie Motor, Bureau Burgerberaad and many, many more organizations. There's a, a whole coalition of about 70 organizations now in the Netherlands that really support a climate citizens assembly. Yeah. Um, and I think it's really uh, our job to make sure that the assembly that will take, if it takes place, that it takes place um, um, with a proper mandate, with an ambitious yeah. question. Uh, and that's also why, indeed, yesterday we, we went to The Hague um, and we, we tried to help the Dutch uh, politicians forming a government. We wrote a, uh, um, uh, um, uh, a piece for the formation paper so that they could just copy-paste it. And just, uh, <laughs> you did the work it. for them. We did yeah. the work for them, uh, but also to show them this is how society wants to help People really want to be engaged in yeah. climate policy. We are worried, uh, but also we, there is a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience in society. Please use it because yeah. we need uh, a vision of the future and of uh, climate policy that is um, compatible with society. Yeah. Okay, so... Um uh, so the, the, the Netherlands is, is gaining, it's gaining momentum here, so, but if we do it, we need to do it in a in a right way um uh, let's let's see because if I'm, I'm just processing all the information that you all gave to me and i think one of the main things that kept on going back uh, coming back was um we need to make sure that it's not framed as a leftist thing we need to make sure that it doesn't become very uh technocratic and really like a, an insider's conversation within the citizen assembly we need to make sure that um uh, politicians actually feel empowered and feel like they they have the mandate to 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 go forward with taking uh, uh the climate policies also further to to achieve the goals um but the, so the big question is how can we make sure that a, a climate citizen assembly can help us do that can help us connect to that broader society can help us um, uh, connect in a way that it stays inclusive and accessible uh, to to everyone, not only the people who participate in it or only the politicians who, who then talk uh, with them or hear mm. their recommendations. Um, so I just want to do a brainstorm with you all. Like what are what are concrete steps that we could take uh, to, to make that happen? What can we really learn from each other in, in that sense? Um, so I'm just going to look in the eyes of, of our Zoom speakers. Yes, David, maybe you want to start? Sure. Um, of course, the Netherlands need a citizens' assembly, but I think it's important to learn from what is happening elsewhere. Exactly. And I'm very happy with what Dimitri just said. The French citizens' assembly was way too big, and it was a job too big to handle in a coherent way. So the question is not whether the Netherlands need a citizens' assembly. The Netherlands need at least 30 citizens' assembly. <laughs> because 
you need to get down to net zero emissions by 2050, which means this is 30 years left. Yeah. And holding at least one citizen's assembly every year, to me, seems crucial. If you do it once, you might as well not do it at all because it's easily forgotten. You have to make sure that this becomes an annoying feature of your democratic framework. You have to make sure that citizens keep on banging that same nail and making sure that their voices are being heard. So I think it's very important to do it on a regular basis. It's also important to do it on a regular basis because it broadens the group of people who will have been involved. The French Convention was fantastic for 150 Frenchmen, but there's millions of people outside. So you need to make sure in the Netherlands to avoid that mistake and to do it on a more regular basis. And to be quite honest, you already have something like this. It's called Prinsjesdag. <laughs> Prinsjesdag is the day on which you discuss the national budget for the next year. A citizen's assembly on the climate is the day on which you discuss the national carbon budget for the next year. And so if you, you're one of the few countries having this wonderful tradition of Prinsjesdag, I think on Prinsjesdag, the queen or the king or the government should not just talk about how much money we are going to spend, but also on how much CO, uh, carbon dioxide you are going to spend. You can do it on the same day. You could also do it in April on Earth Day, for instance, where you have an annual tradition where government says what has been done with the recommendations of last year's convention, last year's uh, climate assembly. On that day in April, people will take stock, government, prime minister, perhaps even the king, will take stock of where you yeah. are in your reduction strategy. Are you behind? Are you before? Or are you on schedule? Are yeah. you even lagging before? And it's in uh, the public eye the, as well. Yeah. Again. It's in the public eye as well. And it absolutely needs to be in the public eye. This yeah. is more important than the budget, your financial budget. Yeah. Because your carbon budget is the one that is really going to condition the future of your society yeah. and the future of your country. Yeah. Okay, David, so you're saying we need to do it over and over and over again. It needs to become a regular, I think you even said an annoying part mm -hmm. <laughs> of our democracy. Uh, don't do it once, but make sure that as many people possible can, can become a part of it, can experience it, but also it becomes way more uh, doable because it's such a big issue. So you, you need more moments uh, to, to talk about it, to deliberate on it. And uh, climate keeps on changing. And, and it keeps, keeps on, on changing, changing more and more rapidly. Yeah. So that's also a reason why you would... You need to be able to steer yes, throughout the, the yeah. moment, but you yeah. need a Prinsjesdag, you need an annual moment, a public moment in which you you also can monitor what is going and what if you need to steer. So those are, those are very concrete uh, suggestions. I'm going to go to Benito, see what, what his plan is going to be. Well, I, I, I totally agree with uh, what uh, David said, and I want to respectfully disagree with uh, part of what uh, Dimitri said, because if we want to, um, in the Netherlands, if we want to have a citizens' assembly and we actually want to do something with what comes out of that, I think we need to depolarize the entire discussion, because we can we can have a citizens' assembly, um, and we can have good plans coming out of that, or not so good of plans, but we can have citizens' assembly. Um, but like David just said, there's a lot of people outside of that citizens' assembly. And if it's still polarized outside, well, politicians are still not going to make those hard choices. They're still not going to risk their seats for the next four years. So, so how, can we, how can we do that, Benito? What would be your suggestions on how we depolarize? Well, I think um, we need to um, um, we need to change the narrative. We need to make um, the movement more positive. I think we need to um, focus more on the, the chances that acting on climate change brings with it, the goals that we can uh, that we can get to, how good it would be for our economy how good it will be for everybody, instead of just saying how much it's going to cost everybody. We need to change the negative uh, perspective on yeah. it. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Definitely. All right. And, and, and then to make that a little bit more concrete, so what would be a good step 
on how to change that narrative? Who needs to do it? Let's start with that. Who needs to change the narrative? Who's going to do it? Well, I'm going to give a, a very easy answer to that. Everybody needs to do that. <laughs> and it starts with, uh, with us. It starts with, with, with me. Um, because, because uh, well, that's what we're also trying to, to say. If I want something, I have to contribute to it. Otherwise, I'm not uh, allowed to say that I want something, to demand it. Mm -hmm. And that means that my organization is trying to be more constructive, trying to start talking to, to people, also talk to organizations that are not necessarily totally engaged in getting more sustainable, talk to them and, 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 and brainstorm with them. What are you going to do? How can we help you? How can we help each other? Because, well, what I'm, what I'm really trying to say, it's everybody's problem. And if we want to solve it, we need everybody to, yeah. everybody's help to fix it. We need to work together. And if we want to work together, we need to change the narrative. And yeah. we, we need to make it more positive. Dimitri, I want to want to turn to you. What would be, I'm I'm sure you you're very you're waiting to to react upon this this issue of depolarizing versus polarizing. But I also really don't waste all your time on that because I want to hear your concrete steps on how we can make this connection, right? How we can make it an inclusive issue as well. I think the, the issue is that there is a polarization. No, we otherwise we won't need we would not need to ask for citizen assembly or protest in the street or or chain yourself to uh, to, to 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 train racks so, for for issues where there is no polarization, there is no social movement, and there is no need for citizen assembly. So I think it's important to acknowledge the fact that there is one, and I think it's interesting because I think you have two ways of framing the narrative of of this polarization. You can either say politicians are a bit coward, and the real problem is that they would like to implement those policies, but they're just afraid of the people. So the people are are the real issue here. They are, they are the one to blame. Or you have the other narrative, which can be actually uh, the people are okay to change, uh, but politicians, because they are so much embedded and connected to uh, corporation lobbyists and a certain way of viewing economy, uh, one could say capitalism mm -hmm. and globalization, they are not going to do it, no matter what, uh, yeah. no matter if the people want it. And I think here the French, so so that so, so that could be the polarization that you look at. And I think the French case here is incredibly interesting, uh, in the in the sense that. No one can say that the politicians didn't feel that they had the mandate or were scared of the backlash of implementing the proposition, the recommendation of the convention, because we have opinion polls that very, very clearly show that the French people would have voted for every single proposition except two of the wow. 149 coming from the, the French convention. So the yeah. people are not so the, the problem So the public support here was, was huge, yeah. Yeah, no, the support was very mm. clear. And so that means that actually uh, the government would have implemented those policies, it would have become more popular. It mm. would have gained momentum and maybe it would have won the next yeah. election, which is not sure it will at all. And I, I think here it's very interesting to look at empirical political science because we, we tend to have this image in our brain of how it works. And it's not how it works. We have a lot of data now on how... Uh, the elective government works, and it works in the interest of the richest. We have studies in the US that are very, very clear in that regard. As long as the rich have a political preference, that political preference is going to be implemented, even if the majority of people, so people who vote, uh, are, are, are against uh, this measure. That explains, for instance, pension reform mm. that are incredibly unpopular and are, mm. are done anyway. So I don't think that the, the proper way of analyzing this is Politicians are just afraid of not being elected. Otherwise, you could not explain yeah. so many things that they do, for yeah. instance, in social reform, breaking public services, yeah. privatizing, which are incredibly unpopular yeah. amongst okay, their, but, their but elected. Okay, but then yeah. let's now get to this the issue solution. because you say there was a lot of public support in France. What can yes. we learn? What made it that the French were so supportive of the citizen assembly, despite its, yeah. its flaws? They were not just supportive of the citizen assembly, they were supportive of the proposition. So actually, mm -hmm. you, you have studies that asked the proposition without specifying it was coming from the citizen assembly and people were, were for those proposition. Uh, and those propositions have been carried out by NGOs and, and various experts for, for, for many years. So it was not new stuff that came out of a hat. It was it was known solutions that the citizen assembly deemed to be good. And I, I think they were right there, but that's a bit outside of my, of my field of competence. And I think <laughs> the main issue that we had in France and that the Irish avoided, and that's why um, they are they are seen as a more successful case, is that they, 
the, we didn't went for a referendum. And we would have went for a referendum on, the, on those stuff. There would have been a political support. And in France, referendum are considered to be a, another way of expressing the will of the demos, of the people, and therefore it, it becomes binding. And there was, the, the, I think the, the French uh, member of the convention made a mistake. They believed that the politicians would be more courageous than the people, mm -hmm. and and they didn't have the data. That I mean, we it was it was awful because we as researcher we had the data that we were forbidden to speak in the assembly. We were just there to study it, so we couldn't say anything. But um, but they would, and and for me that's that's how you connect um, a, a mini public to a maxi public. A if you know that you're going to have a referendum, it means mm -hmm. that everybody needs to understand what is at stake. You cannot talk in jargon and and, and acronyms and complex stuff. You need to make it accessible to everybody. And yeah. you need to make the whole work and the whole debate fully transparent to everybody that wants to follow, because those people are going to be the one approving or rejecting the proposition. So you, yeah. want, you want them to be able to see how they do it. And that's going to mobilize everything. That's, good. that's, that's how it worked in Ireland for, for both the referendum yeah. on, on yeah, same-sex marriage and, and abortion. Yeah. The, the whole society was committed debating. It was not just the people in the room that were debating. Everybody yeah. was but engaging. What, what would be the question then? Would it be... Uh, in a referendum, there's only usually a yes or no option. So would it be, do you uh, accept all of the recommendations or do you accept none of the uh, recommendations? Yeah. That, I don't think that would be a very constructive way to go about. You, you, could, you could do several stuff. First of all, you could do proposition by proposition, which is actually what the what the citizen assembly, uh, the French Convention wanted. They want they didn't want to vote by bloc, uh, by, by 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 chunk of proposition. They wanted to vote proposition by proposition. So that's the first thing. Uh, but the second thing is that usually, yeah, that's that's do you approve or reject the law proposition? But the thing is that if the law proposition is containing as I, as I said, almost every measure you want <laughs> and has not been implemented for, for the past years, uh, even, though, even though it seems very appealing to you as a citizen, mm. uh, then, th then why, why, why would you vote against it? Especially because also referendums are known, and we have, I used to work in yeah. Switzerland, so uh, a are known to increase to the, yeah. the knowledge of the whole citizen, yeah. citizenry. For instance, the Swiss people are the most educated on European institution, but they're not in the European Union because they vote on their adhesion to European yeah. Union or not very frequently. Yeah. And, and the final <laughs> final word I, I would say, it's like, it's a question of democratic legitimacy. In the end, if you want to revitalize, revitalize democracy, you need to go back to the root of what it means, which means ruled by the people. And you need to show that uh, you trust them and they're not just like uh, sheep <laughs> that you need to make votes. Yeah. Once in, once in a while, and, and then that's it. They they go out. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Dimitri. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask because I see that David has raised his uh, digital hand, and I also know that he he um, he might connect to this issue of referendum that Eva also uh, proposed. So, David, please, what is your perspective on on this proposal? I'll be very brief. I agree with Dimitri that injecting a form of direct democracy might really broaden the, the connection with the mini public and the maxi public, the participants to the Climate Citizens Assembly and the society at large. The problem is if you want to depolarize your society on climate, a referendum risks to do the, 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 the opposite. Referendums like the Brexit referendum has divided the United Kingdom, United Kingdom into a divided kingdom for many years to come. And there's an idea that might be useful in that respect, and I think Dimitri has been hinting at it as well. It's the idea not of a referendum, but a preferendum. Which Rather is... than a simple yes or no question, a preferendum would give you a list of 30 or perhaps the 149 recommendations from the parish, from the, from the French uh, Citizens Convention. And online or in a voting booth, all citizens of France or the Netherlands could indicate which one uh, seemed to them most valuable, most urgent, and most important. Yeah, so that they could way. share their, their preference, hence preference. Absolutely. Yeah. Rather than that, dividing your society, you will have a list of shared priorities. And I think it's important because if you have one citizen's assembly, you make 150 people happy. If you do 30 citizen's assemblies, like I just suggested, yeah. you make 4,500 people happy. But there's 17 million Dutch people. So a preferendum would be a great way to broaden the scope from the 150 or the 4,500 to include the majority of your Dutch population. 
and that in a clever way could give you a list of uh, topics and policy policies that should be taken urgently and for which uh, massive social support is known. Okay, so we we actually so we have a couple of things, right? So uh, repetition is crucial. Um, uh, uh, what Benito also uh, put in the mix is the 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 constant work of having constructive conversation with as many organizations, people, institutions. So basically also building the movement, eh? uh, uh, continuing the movement bottom up is a very important factor to, to reach as many people and to reach this, what, what you call the maxi public, right? So not the mini public of the people participating in the citizen assembly, but the maxi public, the society uh, in, in normal terms um, is also an important one, uh, thereby step by step changing this narrative, uh, trying to, to, to inject it as much as possible into the broader society. Um, and then we can, uh, if we are, at the one hand, we are very transparent about the process so that it's also possible for people to learn about what is actually happening within the citizen assembly. Um, we could then sort of test it or, 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 or um, like measure the temperature of how the rest of society is thinking about the specific um, recommendations that are being made in the citizen assembly, either through a referendum as, as Dimitri proposed, but maybe uh, even better through a preferendum in which you can be able, well, you can um, keep the nuance into the conversation uh, maybe. Um, we're, we have to round up, but I just want to very briefly, but you can really only answer with like <laughs> one word or two words. Like, is there some really crucial element that we are now forgetting uh, if we want to make this step of, of, of really, really putting the citizen, the climate citizen assembly into a broader society? Is there something that we miss? Something that we cannot leave unsaid? Maybe I can, oh, sorry. Two words, eh, Benito? <laughs> Definitely. Well, I think from the, the, the younger perspective, um, there's a big difference between uh, polarization and disagreement. I don't think we need polarization. And I think disagreement is, without disagreement, there wouldn't be a need for citizens assembly. But I think polarization is the opposite of what we need. Yeah. That's okay. uh, my final remark. Yeah. David? Yeah. Or Dimitri? Yeah. No, no, go first. David. <laughs> okay, Dimitri, you're going to get the word. Uh, just, 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 yeah, maybe, maybe one thing that could be important is that also, if there is a commitment to hold a referendum from the start, it becomes very clear. And that means that precisely the whole phase of cherry picking that happened in France is prevented because then you have a binding legal mechanism because it's an assembly are not legal. They don't exist. They yeah. are just out of pure will of the politician and they can be cast away as yeah. soon as they don't want them anymore. Yeah. So if they do what the Canadian did, which is commit to something that is a legal constitutional mechanism. Yeah. As so make the output sure it's, of the assembly. Yeah, it's there. Okay. Good. That's a good addition. David, your last brilliant idea. <laughs> More of a philosophical idea. <laughs> the democracy is not about solving conflict. It's about dealing with conflict. Mm. I fully agree with Dimitri and also Benito that conflict is something very fruitful. It means that we care about things are done and we think about things differently. There's nothing bad about that. Uh, and citizens' assemblies might just help us to deal with conflict. Great. Thank you. Eva. Well, final words. Very brief. I think um, uh, climate change is a global problem. And I think we need also a global climate citizens assembly. Yeah. I think that would be very, we need citizen, climate citizens assembly on every level, on the local level, national level, European level, but also very much on yeah. a global scale. Global so let's climate. broaden this maxi yeah, to this super, super, super yeah. maxi well, scale. What, what we do yeah. in the global north highly affects people in the global south and they suffer the yeah. most from our uh, pollution. So yeah. I think a global climate citizens assembly would be, uh, well, would be my uh, 
ultimate dream. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you all very, very much uh, for joining, for sharing your wisdom uh, and for, uh, well, in our session, really having a, a collective brain uh, exercise. Uh, Dimitri, I hope we, uh, we did it in the right way. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you also for watching. Um, so like I said at the beginning, for the people who are interested and uh, want to know more, have a look at the knowledge platform that we are developing. Uh, you can see the previous live calls. You can listen to the podcast. Um, uh, but you can also read a lot, a lot, a lot of research articles, uh, interviews that we have done with uh, various key players from all over Europe. Um, uh, and uh, our final session uh, of this project is already coming up. Uh, it's going to be in September, September 8th. Right, yes. Eva. Yeah, September yeah. 8. Uh, also here uh, at Pakhuis de Zwijger. Hopefully, also with uh, some people in the in the room, uh, if uh, if COVID allows us to. Um, and then we're gonna present all this this different fruits that we picked from uh, from this uh, research project that we did, uh, trying to make sure that we prevent the pitfalls for further initiatives uh, that we well, sort of see what the, what the power is of connecting all different movements uh, throughout Europe. Uh, and then, well, maybe we will arrive at your dream, Eva, of uh, uh, achieving a global ci uh, climate citizen assembly. Uh, so until that time, so keep an eye on the website. September 8 is going to be the final one. Um, uh, get in touch if you would like to share and uh, a very lovely evening to you all.